joints of the human body are considered to be part of the skeletal system. This, of course, is where the bones that are definitely part of the skeletal system are all in contact with one another. Now, last week we looked at that blue handout that has a list of all the joints in the human body. We checked off the 10 that you need to know as part of the lower limb of the body. And so I did give you a little bit of information here um, related to this. So some of this will just be redundant, okay? But that's okay. Remember that joints or articulations, and we're going to use the word articulation from time to time. It's really the same word. It's just like a fancy word for a joint. Remember that these are the meeting places for two bones. People have a tendency when they think of joints to think that it's somewhere where the body is moving, but that is not the case. Movement does not need to take place there. And I think I pointed out the bones of the skull you can see where they meet, and you can see that there are still lines there. They are distinctly separate bones, and yet we're going to call the, those places where they meet a joint. So you want to start. Make sure you've got that clearly set in your mind. Now, there are two basic classification systems. I'm not going to go into it a lot. One classifies joints by how much movement takes place there, either no movement, a little tiny bit of movement, or a lot of movement. <clears throat> and that's fine, but I, I prefer the anatomical classification. Okay, the anatomical classification is this. And we kind of you can see this outline in your blue handout, and you can see it here on this cream colored outline that we're using for this lecture. And basically, we're saying that the joints are defined by the tissues that hold the bones together. So if it's dense collagenous connective tissue, that's the only thing there holding the two bones together, then it's a fibrous joint. If cartilage is the only thing there holding the two bones together, then we're going to call it a cartilaginous joint. And the synovial joint is the term we use for a complex set of tissues that holds two bones together but allows them the freedom to move. So this category is really the same no matter which, um, which pattern of categorization you use. It's just the other two that are really a little bit different. So fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial, the three classifications of joints. Now, within each of these, there are subtypes. And you need to know um, what those types are, and you need to be able to give me an example of those. So let's go through each one and talk about the subtypes here. Okay, in the fibrous joints, dense collagenous tissue, the first one there is a syndesmosis. Syndesmosis is basically a fibrous type joint where you have sheets or cords that are holding the two bones together. The picture here shows you the two bones of your forearm. Just like your leg has two bones in it, your forearm does. And in fact, the pattern is the same. The two bones kind of operate as one because you can see from one end of the bone to the other, the two bones are locked together with sheets and cords of connective tissue. This is the example of a syndesmosis. Now, since we don't know the names of these two bones together, the one that we're going to use as an example is the joint we call the tibiofibular joint. So you could imagine, I think, imagine that the tibia and the fibula were in this picture and that you can see the tissues right from one end to the other. Okay? You can see... Um, that the tibia and the fibula, that, that gap between the two of them has sheets of connective tissue in there. So that, that is a good example of what a syndesmosis is. The second 
fibrous type joint is the suture. Sutures are found in the skull and they are the tiny little gaps here between the bones. Many, many of the bones in the skull are flat bones and so they meet along their edges and you can see that the bones interweave themselves together. We say interdigitate, kind of the concept of putting your fingers together like so and creating a, uh, a weaving together, but there still is a gap there. It's a microscopic gap, if you will, and down in that little space there, there are these little collagenous fibers down there holding the edges of the bones together. So it's tiny little fibers down in these little gaps between the bones holding them together. Now, let me take you just a little bit farther than that. Do you remember the name of the membrane that is covering the surface of any and all bones? Peri, periosteum, remember that? Now just imagine for a minute that I've got this, but then I've got a periosteum over each bone, right? And what you would see here is the periosteum would just go right from one bone to the other. It would be a continuous thing right here. So I've got this continuous periosteum kind of creating a, a leotard around the entire skull right here. But then down in the little gaps, you'd find the little microscopic fibers holding the edges together and keeping the bones actually separate from one another. Okay, You want to begin to get this bigger and bigger picture of how the connective tissues weave and tire, tie the entire skeleton together. Connective tissues are really at the heart of that. And, and you'll see that in other ways as we move along here. Uh, the periosteum is really keeping things together. Say um, in a very young child, a year old child has got a soft spot right here, right? A fontanelle where the edges of the bone are still growing together and still ossifying. But there's a periosteum over the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's the suture. The third type of fibrous joint is the gomphosis. And basically the only place we find this is where the teeth are attached into the jaw. I don't know about you, but I don't know if you ever thought about it. Do you ever think about how your teeth are attached into your jaws? You know, the teeth obviously fit down in little sockets in the jaw bones, well, they're actually roped in, right? The root of the tooth and the bone itself are tied to one another by connective tissues, what we call periodontal ligaments. They're not cemented in. If you, if you grab a tooth and push a little bit, most teeth in your mouth will wiggle a slight amount, will wiggle a little bit. And that's because there is tiny, tiny little bits of flexibility here. You really know this is going on when you think of a child who's about to lose a tooth, right? When the tooth is growing up from, the new tooth is growing up from below, the roots of the tooth dissolve and usually wind up with just like a little chunk of a tooth, right? When a kid's tooth falls out. But just before it does, you usually say, oh, that tooth is just hanging on by a thread. Sure it is, right? Just, and it'll wiggle and wobble and it's just there's a little bit of thread holding that tooth. Well, actually the entire tooth was roped or threaded into the jaw. So teeth are not really bones. They're not osseous tissue. They're, we don't have compact or cancellous bone here, but we consider them to be part of the skeletal system. And we really don't have time here to go into their entire structure. So we're not gonna do that. But, but the teeth are considered to be part of the skeletal system. And so this, we're going to call this a joint. And it's one of the three types of fibrous joints in the human body. A-okay? Everybody good with that? Okay, so three types of fibrous joints, two types of cartilaginous joints. Cartilaginous joint, I've got two bones that meet and there's just a piece of cartilage between the two. The two types of 
joints are defined by the type of cartilage. You know there's three types of cartilage. There are no elastic cartilage type joints. There's no elastic cartilage found in a joint. But the synchondrosis is hyaline cartilage. Great example of that would be here in the rib cage. Imagine, again, can you imagine that there's a periosteum here that just runs right over the surface of the cartilage and then right onto the breastbone. Just imagine everything here covered with connective tissues over the surfaces. Technically, when it covers a piece of cartilage, we call it the perichondrium instead of the periosteum. And by now, if you've been paying attention, you probably have noticed that that word chondro shows up again and again and again when we're talking about cartilage. Going forward, this is very useful. You're in a situation, somebody says some word that you've never heard before, but you hear chondro in the middle of the word. Boom, you, you know that word has something to do with cartilage. All right, osteo, bone, chondro, cartilage. So this is a synchondrosis, right, with cartilage. It happens to be hyaline. Um, this is also the cartilage of the growth plates. Um, I, I don't want to get so technical that I think of these as joints. Some people do. Most textbooks will do that. You say, oh, in a child's bone, you've really got one bone is really three bones. And the cartilage here really is a joint between the two pieces of bone. Technically, that's probably right. Practically, that's kind of out on the edge, I think. So, But it, technically, it's right, I guess. We're not going to use that. We'll use like the rib cage as a good example of a synchondrosis here. The other one, uh, the other type is the symphysis, fibrocartilage. And we do have an example here in the lower, lower limb, the pubic joint is our one cartilaginous joint for the lower limb. And so this little pad between the two pubic bones is a piece of fibrocartilage, very tough stuff. And we've used this one before. In fact, this was on the test, wasn't it? Right, fibrocartilage is found where? Right, between the vertebra. The intervertebral discs are fibrocartilage. So there are a number of of fibrocartilage type joints, the ones we call a symphysis. This would be the pubic symphysis. This would be the intervertebral symphysis. In fact, that just brings to mind one of those little bits of a word that you must know. The word inter, I-N-T-E-R, inter. What does that word mean? Okay, how many think it means inside of something? No, okay? Typically, when people hear that, the first thing they think is inside. It does not. It means between, okay? Inter means between. So if I say intervertebral, what do I mean? Between two vertebra, right? If I say intercondylar, I mean between two condyles. I'm looking for something between the two condyles. If I say intertrochanteric, I mean... Something in between the two trochanters. There's a greater trochanter and a lesser trochanter. I mean something between those two. So there's a crest running between the two on the posterior side, and there's an intertrochanteric line running between the two on the anterior side of the bone. So you're going to hear the word inter, inter, inter all over the place throughout human anatomy. You must think between, between two things. Okay. So there are all of our cartilaginous and our fibrous joints, okay? So in our handout here, we've just described examples of each one of these, and we've given you some places where you could locate those, right? You want to make sure you know those. Um, if you've got all the other handouts, you have this somewhere, because they were all here and you picked up one of everything. Oh, okay. Let's, we'll deal with that later. But yeah, I've got plenty of handouts. And if you ever are lacking a handout and you're at home, where are they? On Blackboard. Right. They're all on Blackboard. You can download and print anything for yourself if you need something at the last minute. Okay. The dog eats it, you know, something like that. You can 
You can get it. Okay, now let's talk about synovial joints. Now, this is a much trickier thing. These other type of joints, you just anchor the parts of the bones together with a piece of fiber or cartilage. Here, I've got to hold two bones tightly together and yet give them the freedom of movement. That's a much, much trickier thing. And typically, it involves a joint capsule, okay, a pocket-type structure, and some fluid to lubricate that. So let's look at synovial joints in more detail. <clears throat> okay, th these joints are going to have this complex set of tissues. There's going to be a lining tissue in this. There's going to be connective tissues. Do you know, do you know the word capsule? Kind of like a space capsule? Right? It's kind of like a chamber, isn't it? It's going to be a chamber of some kind surrounding the joint. And it's going to be lubricated with what we call synovial fluid, related to the fact that these are synovial joints. When you take notes here, don't try and write down every single word. Okay? Some people I see, they're, just, they're trying to copy every... It's kind of like you give somebody a highlighter in a textbook, and the whole book's yellow, you know? You, you're trying to just find significant words, important little pieces, put things in your own words so they mean more to you. Let's look at a representative synovial joint. Let's look at a, a picture of, of a typical sort of synovial joint. This is the one that your textbook uses, so you've got a copy of this. You can look at it later. Notice that I've got two bones here that meet. Right? They're touching one another. And if you look closely, you can see that there is kind of a capsule structure, kind of a pocket or a chamber surrounding this, these places where the bones meet. Um, you should know, too, that sometimes this picture shows up on the test. See if you know the structure, if you can, if you can know and label the structure of this. So let's, let's talk about the elements. You can see the elements listed there. Let's see if we can describe the elements here. Number one would be the fact that the two bones where they touch are covered with cartilage. And anywhere they are going to rub against one another, there's going to be cartilage. The rest of this can be bone, but where they touch and rub is cartilage. What type of cartilage? What? Hyaline cartilage, exactly. The smoothest type, the one with the least amount of fiber in it. Enough fiber to just give it a consistency, but not very much. These, the cartilage here is slick and smooth, right? The thing that we want here is no friction, if possible. We don't want any rubbing as much as possible. So the ends of the bones are always covered with articular cartilage. Articular cartilage is kind of a functional description. The, what it is, is hyaline cartilage. It's kind of like saying, who am I? I'm a human being, or I'm David, that's who I am. But you could also describe me as a college instructor. That's what I do. Right? Two different ways to describe me. I can describe this as hyaline cartilage, what it is, or articular cartilage, what it does. Because there are other bits of hyaline cartilage throughout the body, like the hyaline in your nose. That is not articular cartilage. It's not a part of a joint. Okay, so first and foremost, any bone that's going to touch in a synovial joint is covered with cartilage. Secondly, we have this capsule. Okay, and the capsule is going to have two layers to it. Two layers to it. The outermost layer is known as the fibrous capsule. So what's it made out of? Fibers. What kind of fibers? Collagen fibers. Strong, dense, irregularly woven sheets of very tough stuff. Think of the skin again. You know, just think of that layer of tough, dense connective tissue. Think of the periosteum. In fact, let's take our picture a little bit farther as we picture the skeletal system. Picture this. 
the periosteum here. You following me? Picture the periosteum. When I get here to the cartilage, the periosteum comes away from the surface of the bone, crosses the gap, and becomes the periosteum of the next bone, isn't it? The periosteum of each bone and the fibrous capsule are continuous. It's almost as if you put the two bones in a sleeve, right? The connective tissue doesn't like go and stop and then start again and then stop. It's all one big continuous bit of connective tissue. It's almost like you put the whole skeleton in a jumpsuit. Right? You know, one of those suits that has the legs and the arms or, you know, like, like the kids' pajamas, right, that are complete and whole. Every bit of skeleton is covered with connective tissue and every gap between the bones... Every space between bones is covered with connective tissue. It's, there's connective tissue everywhere. And it just happens that periosteum becomes fibrous capsule, becomes periosteum, becomes fibrous capsule at the next joint, and periosteum. So it's one big continuous sheet of connective tissue. Right. When you, if you're pointing to this layer here, you want to describe this as the fibrous capsule. Yeah. Now, just inside that is the second layer, which is called the synovial membrane. Now, the synovial membrane then lines everything inside the capsule except the cartilage. So there are places where the synovial membrane, if the periosteum is away from the surface of the bone, if there's a gap here between the periosteum and the bone, the fibrous, the, um, the synovial membrane will come over and actually cover the side of the bone. Okay? The synovial membrane is an epithelial type tissue. It's got a surface to it. Right? It's going to have a basement membrane that holds it to the fibrous capsule. But it's, there's a gap. There's spaces. Right? So this blue... They've colored it blue in the picture. This, this here is the synovial membrane. Synovial membrane is very slick. And what that does then is every surface inside the capsule is slick. The cartilage is slick. The synovial membrane is slick. The other thing with the synovial membrane is the cells produce synovial fluid. So the membrane is producing a fluid that occupies the little spaces here between the structures. And that fluid is its kind of like soap. It's very slick, very slippery. The joint is self-lubricating. The joint provides its own lubrication. So I've got, I've got what I would consider to be a cavity, an empty space. Here, in and around, there's space between the two bones. There's spaces in here. The one thing that you want to think, though, is the spaces do not look like this. The artist has drawn this picture with big, wide spaces between the structures so that you can see them more clearly. In real life, everything in here is very snug, right? This thing that is bulged out to the side is snug and right up against this. The membrane doesn't have to produce a lot of fluid, just enough to fill the little tiny gaps between the structures. So your joints under normal operating conditions, uh, all the tissues are very snug and tight, very slippery, right? You know, even as, after as many years as I've been around, you know, you can just, you can move your joints and there's just no, there's no friction there. You, know, you move an elbow and it just moves smoothly. Now, in some diseases like arthritis, if the cartilage begins to wear away, you can start getting a grit, gritty surface there that is not frictionless. And then that grittiness can wear away more and more. You can work this right down to the bone. And then people just don't want to move their joints because you're grating bone on bone. The other thing, too, is sometimes people will sprain a joint, like you sprain an ankle. What typically happens when you sprain a joint? 
Does it swell up? It swells up, exactly. There's rich blood supply here constantly feeding this epithelial tissue here, right? And any time the synovial membrane gets irritated, it just starts pumping out more fluid to try and push things away from itself and protect itself. And typically what happens then is that the capsule can swell up with fluid and become balloon-like. There's no way out, so it just it literally fills up like a balloon. And that's kind of what this joint, this joint looks like, one that's been damaged and is swollen. In, uh, in athletic injuries where these things so often happen, you're constantly using things to try and decrease the swelling. Sometimes the production of synovial fluid or bleeding into this space, the swelling will produce more injury than the actual um, injury produced in the first place. You always try and minimize the swelling in a joint. But it's just a natural consequence of disrupting the synovial membrane. Now, no matter which type of synovial joint you're talking about, and if you looked at your list, you could see there are six types. They all have these elements. They all have cartilage when the bo where the bones touch. They all have a capsule-like structure with a synovial membrane producing fluid so the surfaces are all slick and rubbed together with no friction. All right, so you want to make sure that you could label all the various structures that you see here. There are a couple of other sort of side elements that we sometimes find associated with synovial joints. Okay, so let me just go back for a minute and make sure that we got interrupted here for a second, but let me go back. Okay, so what we're talking about is a bursa being a piece of synovial membrane that migrates away from the main structure of the joint and is really providing protection from something rubbing against the side of the bone or some other structure that's in and around, sometimes slightly removed from the joint itself, but providing some other kind of protection from friction in and around or near the joint. Uh, the other way that sometimes synovial membranes migrate a little bit is in a structure called <coughs> Hang on. Um, I'm not getting to that yet. Here's, here's an example. I forgot I'd put this picture in here. Here's a picture of the bursa. Uh, here's the shoulder. You can see all of these bits of connective tissue holding the humerus into the shoulder blade. And if we saw the capsule in here, you'd see the synovial membrane. But if you look right up here, between the bone that's above the humerus here, this little white area right here represents a bit of synovial membrane and connective tissue that pouches out and protects this superior part of the humerus from bumping up and rubbing against this. This is a bursa right here that's, that's protecting that. And I th yeah. So this, this is a real life example other than that uh, other picture that we have there. All right, the main joint capsule would be here, and the bursa then is out to the side. Okay, so should know what a bursa is. Now the second one that you want to know is what's called a tendon sheath. This is where the, the connective tissue and the synovial membrane form sort of a sleeve around a tendon. Tendons are the connective tissues that attach muscles to bones. And again, sometimes that tendon is placed in such a way that it would rub against the side of a bone. In that case, the synovial membrane may make a little bit of a sleeve around the tendon. Uh, an example of this from a real life 
perspective is what you see right here. Here's the main capsule here. This is, again, that shoulder area. And here's a tendon. Actually comes, this is one of the tendons of your biceps muscle. And that tendon runs right up in a groove on the humerus here and up into the shoulder. And there's a sleeve because it's running right along the side of the bone and kind of curving over the side of the bone. There's a sleeve or a tendon sheath surrounding that, protecting that. <coughs> Pardon me. So, this is, this is the picture as it looks in your book with all the different parts labeled. Uh, notice a bursa and a tendon sheath labeled in the picture. So, make sure you know these basic elements of the synovial joint and those two accessory structures that may or may not be present. Typically only present in the more complicated areas where you've got a lot of muscle and joint and bone and many, many things going on like, like the shoulder would. Okay? So that's a synovial joint. Now the synovial joint has six types. And you can see those again in your handout. Right? The pivot, the hinge, the saddle, the ellipsoid. Oops, didn't spell that right. That's supposed to be ellipsoid, not episoid, or whatever that word is. Okay, ball and socket and plane. And what makes them different? Well, they all have those basic elements we talked about. They're distinguished by the shapes of the surfaces and how the tendons and ligaments are placed. They each have different amounts, different shapes, provide different extents and ranges of motion. So let's just, you've got pictures of these again in your textbook. Let's just look through them. Um, the joint here is the pivot joint. In this picture, and what you have is a bone that is not really moving somewhere, but just spinning. Um, the example here is in your forearm. And whether you've noticed it or not, you're able to do something interesting with your hand here in that the bones of your forearm allow you to rotate in such a way that you can go palm down and palm up. Try that with your foot. Right? Can you flip your foot up and, you know, you can't do that with the bottom of your foot like you can here. And that's because there's a pivoting joint here in your forearm that allows this type of rotation. Notice when I do this movement, my arm isn't going anywhere. It's not like I'm doing this or this. It's not moving to another location. It's just spinning on its axis. That's an action we call rotation. Um, the forearm is, is an example and the neck, there's a special pivoting joint here in your neck so that when you rotate your head like this, you have a freedom of rotation there. We call this a monoaxial type joint because it only allows for one type of motion. When a, when a joint just allows one kind of movement to happen, we call it monoaxial. The other basic monoaxial joint is the hinge joint. There's two types of monoaxial joints. Let me get through these. Okay, here's a picture of the hinge type joint, kind of like the hinge on a door. When you have a door that is hinged, it just swings basically in one direction does open and close, but it's one, it doesn't spin around, doesn't go up and down, doesn't go side to side, it just swings on its hinges. And so, like your, your knee, your elbow, these are all swinging, hinging kinds of joints. Your fingers, all of the interphalangeal joints are hinge type joints. In fact, we've got three of these, right? We've got the knee, the ankle, and the toes are all hinge type joints in the lower limb. We'll use the knee and the toes here as good examples. And again, this is monoaxial because only one thing that can happen. If you look at your, your toes, right, your toes do this or they do this. That's all, right? 
can't do any, they can't spin around, they can't go side to side. Those little joints in there, that's all they can do. They're hinging. The saddle type joint is the, the only example we're going to use. There's a couple of them in the human body, but most of them are very obscure. The one that's very unique is the one right here at the base of your thumb and your hand. Notice that the two surfaces, the two bones have surfaces that are shaped like a riding saddle. And if you fit the two saddles together, what you get is what we consider to be a biaxial joint because you can move in more than one direction. Um, the saddle joint here at the base of your thumb allows your thumb to swing in and work with your fingers. Technically, we call that opposing your fingers. Most animals in our world that have a thumb have a thumb that works like a finger. All it does is this. If you've got a cat or a dog at home, they have a thumb type digit. But all it does is this, right? Only you and I and a few species of apes have thumbs that can do this, that can help grip something, right? And that, my thumb can go this way, but it can also go this way. And it's due to the joint right down here at the base which is a saddle joint. We think of it as biaxial because it can swing this way or it can swing this way. It's two distinct motions. You can get a combination of motions, but it's the shapes of the surfaces allow for two distinct type motions. That's the, uh, the saddle joint there, and we think of it as biaxial. The other biaxial joint is the the ellipsoid, why did I spell that wrong? You've got it spelled right in your handout. Ellipsoid. Do you know what an ellipse is? Anybody? What? Oval, right? Mathematics, if you're in mathematics, a rhombus is a diamond, an ellipse is an oval, right? So the shapes here, the surfaces, you can see, are oval in shape. Because there's two distinct distances, one wider than the other, we think of the surfaces here as having two distinct types of motion. Good example of this would be here where your fingers meet your hand. We're going we're gonna to use the feet here. If you think of where your toes meet your foot, if you do this, I can hinge here, can't I? But something happens here that doesn't happen up here. What can happen here? What else can I do besides this? Yeah, I can do this, can't I? I've got a biaxial motion. I can do this kind of motion and this kind of motion. Now, I can't do that out here in my finger, right? My finger can go side to side here, but if I hold that steady, this does not go side to side here. These are... Right, these are hinging joints. This is an ellipsoid joint, right? That allows you to do this and this. And obviously you have a lot more motion this way than you have this way, right? And that's because the oval allows a lot more motion this way than it does that way, right? So this is a biaxial joint too. It's ellipsoid. Carly. Oh, oh Tia. It has two L's, and my handout probably has one. I'm having a hard, no, I have two L's there. I don't have any L's up here. I don't know what I, don't know what I did, what I was thinking. I must have been in a hurry when I was doing this or something. Yeah. I don't know. I saw the E, the e and the oid, and I thought, oh, it's okay. I don't know. All right. So, um, again, we're looking this would have this would have the joint capsule, the whole nine yards. Everything's there, but it's got these unique shapes. Probably the most unique shape of all is the next one in our list, the ball and socket, right? Where you literally have a ball type structure fitting into a socket. This shows us the shoulder, which is one of the two. But of course, we've got the best one here in the lower limb, with the head of the femur fitting into the acetabulum, don't we? So the, the hip is, is a great example for us. 
or the coxal. Now this is considered a multi-axial joint because these ball and socket joints allow tons of different kinds of motion and lots of range typically. Lots of range and, and lots of different kinds of motion. So we call these multi-axial. The last one here, the plane joint, the word plane here is used like in mathematics to mean a flat surface. When we have two bones that essentially are both flat and they touch and all they do is slip and slide on each other. Some books call this the gliding joint because the bones just glide against each other. This is the plane joint. Because you can move in many, many different directions, I consider this multi-axial. Your textbook will actually call this monoaxial. We'll call it what I want to call it, okay? Um, so we're going to consider this multi-axial. It is one kind of sliding, but you can go many, many different directions. So I'm going to consider it multi-axial. And for you and I, the best example would be all the little flat places between the tarsals. When you look at the posterior part of the foot, you see the calcaneus and the talus and the cuboid, all the little tarsals there. And if you look down in between each one, every surface where one touches another, there's cartilage, there's a capsule, there's synovial membrane, there's synovial fluid. They don't move a lot. They just kind of slip and slide just gently against each other. But all of those are what we consider to be plane joints. Okay, so six types, right? Two of them monoaxial, two biaxial, two multiaxial locations here. You can see the questions, right? You could write the questions for me, I know. You know, where do I find a ball and socket joint? Or which two joints are multiaxial? You know, all sorts of questions related to those facts right there. Okay, any last questions about this? Okay.